Art is part of the landscape of our community. Time now to take a tour of some uniquely Wisconsin public art. On this episode of the Arts Page, find out who are the wall dogs and what they did in Delavan, Wisconsin to bring people together and highlight the town's history in a really big way. Learn why these Milwaukee students got hands-on to create a neighborhood mural and celebrate Shorewood's heritage with a sensory experience of a haunting historical high-speed train. That's all coming up now on The Arts Page. The Arts Page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Honoring Helen Daniels Bader's passion for the arts and creativity, the fund brings community arts to underserved audiences and is a proud supporter of local arts programming on Milwaukee PBS. Welcome to the Arts Page. I'm your host, Sandy Max. Southeastern Wisconsin is filled with artistic sights and sounds. Public art can do a lot of things for us. Entertain and inform, preserve heritage, and connect a community. First, we meet the Wall Dogs, an international movement to celebrate a town's unique history by painting murals on local buildings. In June of 2015, Wall Dogs from around the world descended on Delavan, Wisconsin, and invited us to share their process to create the greatest walls on earth. Having a wall dog event is like opening up an artist's studio and anybody can watch and see from start to finish how we prepare all this art. The Delavan Wall Dog Project was brought up about three years ago by Brad and Kit Bando. They own Brush Fire Signs. And he and his wife, Kit, are wall dogs. They thought it'd be neat to bring it to this area, and they thought that Delavan had the most to offer. So they approached the Downtown Business Association and started talking to them about the project and how they think that it could impact Delavan. The Delavan Wall Dogs is basically just the community that we're in, Delavan, Wisconsin, Circus Town. And they're inviting other artists from this community that have never done this before and paint with us. We can't do anything, any business that is still in business because this is not advertising, this is all history. Primarily what we do is we celebrate the history. Yeah, of so the town. We go back into the history of the town to find out the most important things and try to include that. Delavan is ideal for a wall dog event because the history isn't uh, singularly focused. It started as a temperance colony, so the people who founded it didn't believe in, in alcohol, slavery. They had, like people, move here so they could have a place where they could live with people like themselves. And then the circus came in, and the Maybe Brothers decided to start their winter quarters here. They chose Delavan because it was so similar to their hometown in New York, and many other circuses followed. Then there's the artist colony here at the turn of the century. The Chicago Art Institute held classes, summer classes here, and drew not only lots of artists here, but it also became a tourist trade tourists would start coming to watch the artists paint. That's mainly what we went for was their history and they had a lot of good walls. Delavan's got the brick street, it's an older town, it's, it's perfect, it's perfect. All the right walls, all the right subjects. Like a lot of old communities are struggling, their downtown areas because of all the modernization moving out of town. And this always brings tourism. People always, they hear about that the murals are here People just love it. And other towns that have had the wild dogs come have seen that. The wild dogs arrive on Wednesday. That night, they project their artwork after the sun goes down, sometimes on a, with a digital projector, sometimes with an overhead and they're on ladders and scaffolding with, with Sharpies and they're tracing their artwork. They have it projected on the wall and they're tracing. Then Thursday morning, they start painting. 
So they're painting all day because they have just four days to finish up these big murals that normally would take a lot longer, but they do have a lot of people working on it at once. We have people from Germany is the furthest away and Canada. We have a lot of guys from Georgia, Florida, a new person from Arizona. We pretty much covered the whole United States. I don't think we have a state we haven't hit this time. And I think our total number is about 160 artists that showed up. It's quite a legacy. Yeah. And they love it, and that's what it's all about. Painting, teaching, sharing what we know. When we're done, we'll have 18 murals. We did the first mural. Our mural depicted the legacy of Albert Gogger, who was a, he was a local artist. And he was a fine artist, but he was also a sign painter. Mm -hmm. So he took the flavor of Delavan and just spread it everywhere. He took photos of everything. So it was a surprise for everybody to go, go back in their father and grandfather's legacy yeah. and just visit the places he was at and the things he did. One of them is a children's mural done by the local high school teacher. So we also have P.T. Barnum. He started his circus here in Delavan. And over a period of time, there was 38 circuses that either started here or merged here. There was a cigar factory, which we didn't know. We have the big band's ballroom. I talked to the art club from Lake Geneva. And one of the ladies, when we were talking, said, I used to come to the dances <laughs> at the ballroom. So we're honoring that. The Red Devils, they had a semi-pro football team in Delavan. So we're honoring the Red Devils, and we're surprised how many people still knew about that. And the Red great, Devils yeah. started the same year as the Packers started. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> so they're extra popular. Yeah. Yes. The boats, the history of the boats on the lake, we're celebrating that. The most prized uh, mural that they wanted to see was something for the deaf school. Yeah. Which was amazing, above the circus. We're using um, acrylic-based paints, quicker dry time, they blend a little easier. When we're done, these walls are, will be clear coated, and then maybe every other year we'll put a clear coat on, and they should last a very long time. We have several of the murals located downtown, but we are trying to keep them in groupings that people would be able to see several by walking around. So you're able to drive past some and walk around. And I think they're well placed. And people were just walking around, you know, thanking the artists and the artists stop and they talk because you know it's a great it's a great time. They want to get to know the artists. Artists want to get known of the history about the town, about their subject. You know, there's always a story. Passion, passion drives this. We all love to paint. We don't get to do it every day. So when you get and then when you get to paint with your friends. It's the best. We serve a function. We're, we're an educational group, too. Yeah. We're bringing the past to the future. I want them to walk away with pride in their town. Now they can say, we're a wall dog town. We've got some awesome history. And I want them to start coming back downtown. That's a type of movement that the wall dogs are. We're, tr we're trying to make positive change. We have a history of art, and so it's important to share that. And it's important for anybody coming to visit here, they're gonna be able to learn through art. And we know after it's done that we're gonna have something to be really proud of. Enjoy the Delavan murals in person with a walk or drive through town, and find more images online at the Delavan Wall Dogs Facebook page. Next, you'll see public art that can create some history. There's a mural in Milwaukee made with little hands that two organizations, Sharp Literacy and the Neighborhood House of Milwaukee, hope will be an artwork that the children who helped create it will return to. We really developed, I think, a great program. It's educational and it's fun. And when you combine those two, it's, it's perfect. 
Sharp Literacy's mission is really to energize urban school children to be confident, capable reading, readers, writers, and researchers through hands-on interaction in the visual arts. We're currently in MPS Charter and Choice Schools, 30 schools, and serve just over 7,000 students a year. The book that we are working with is the 12th We Love to Learn book, There Grows the Neighborhood, Agriculture in the City. It's a third grade curriculum. It's on urban farming. And the, the premise of the book is how Milwaukee became the urban agriculture um, capital of the world. And it's in the future. You guys are doing mixed beef. They, they have a hard time believing that they're really learning when they're doing fun activities like the mural. We have over 15 murals in the city in all different locations. We have murals at the General Mitchell International Airport. We have them at the War Memorial, Marquette University, Rockwell Automation, Discovery World, and they're all indoor murals. So this is the, the first mural that will be an outdoor mural. Um, they had just renovated a, an empty lot right down the street from the neighborhood house. Neighborhood House of Milwaukee is a community center which has been serving Milwaukee's near west side for over 70 years. We provide a broad range of family services from preschoolers right up through um, uh, teenagers. We wanted to um, transform that lot from, a, from a, a vacant underused space into a lively part of the community. That's where Sharp came in. Sharp Literacy partnered with us to create a mural that's going to be in that park, we're going to be installing about a 16-foot mural that's mounted on four very large posts in a prominent location within the park. The whole theme of the mural is, is garden and urban agriculture. The kids working on this project reflect Milwaukee and especially Milwaukee's central city. We're working with Sally Duback, a local artist who's done a variety of murals in partnership with Sharp Literacy. I started doing them maybe 18 years ago. I develop mural projects following the, the work of Simon Sparrow as, as an inspiration. And he worked with glitter and found objects and jewel, jewelry and so forth. So I had to figure out a way to, to do these murals and come up with something that was really a very durable material. The mural is created with our children working with Sally on a series of, of Mondays where the kids have been working really hard to create the, the pieces that are going to become this large mural in the garden park. When I go to work with the students, I have them do um, drawings. We, we usually spend a session or two making drawings and talking about the theme. And then I transfer that onto the, the panels Rather than use a lot of commercial tiles that we purchased, I thought it would be fun if we made them from scratch. So I brought in some really, really high fire, tough clay and um, rolled it out in big slabs for them and I had them make hundreds of tiles. I had had the, the tiles bisque fired and then brought them back and they glazed them. When they did the self-portrait pieces, I had them each do a drawing, a pencil drawing, self-portrait, and then cut it out and use it as a cookie cutter kind of thing, lay it down on the clay and then trace around it with a pencil. And you can actually cut it out with a pencil. Of course, when they dried, many of them broke into several pieces. But once I bisque fired them and they glazed them, I said, it doesn't matter if they're in pieces and actually it's more appropriate to the finished mural that they, they go onto the mural in pieces and we'll put them together like a puzzle. So there will be about 30 selfies on this, this mural and it'll be really charming. I try to incorporate as many found objects as I can. It's a little more difficult with this particular mural because it's going to be outdoors. So any found objects have to be made out of metal or glass, beach glass, beads, broken costume jewelry, things like that, mirrors. When I spread the goo on the, on the mural, panels, they do all the detailing and it's usually a free-for-all and I'm just there to kind of direct traffic. But I love the way children do these because they have sort of a random, wonderful, reckless and fearless way of putting them together. We're really creating a piece that's put together somewhat spontaneously. The elements they'll see are things that I pulled from, the, from their drawings. There's a sun, giant sunflowers, corn stalks, couple of raised garden beds, 
an apple tree with an, a ladder leaning up against it. And then there are buildings to suggest the urban landscape. But the self-portraits are probably going to be the most important element. It'll look like a primitive painting. Everything will be out of scale, but that's what's charming about children's art. Their component might be small, but when they see it stretched across this really large mural on a prominent location in Milwaukee, it's going to build, I hope, a sense of expectations for them in their own futures. And I think it's just a, a good way to, to really show the community that we're trying to make a difference, that we're all in this together. We all have the same, uh, we want the same outcome. We want to help educate our, our urban school children. So this is a way for us to display our work, display the work that, that our students have done to show how important uh, public art is, you know, to sharpen into our mission. We want it to be eye-catching so that uh, even a car that's passing on 27th Street that might not even glance towards our park is going to have to look at it just because of the vibrancy of the color that the kids and Sally have created. This is going to mean a lot to them over time, and then to see the finished project in the park, you know, is really utterly amazing. One, two, three, yahey! I'm hoping that the kids return again and again to 27th and Richardson and see what they created and have a sense for the potential for future creations as well. They're going to come back to us as teenagers, perhaps as young parents, maybe even as, as, as uh, grandparents, and be able to point to themselves up on that mural and say, I did that, you can do that too. We are making a difference in our community. You can enjoy the mural Sharp Literacy and the Neighborhood House of Milwaukee created called Drop to Dinner in the Garden Park on 27th Street and Richardson Place. Find out more about the Sharp Literacy Community Murals program on their website, sharpliteracy.org. In the 1930s, a high-speed train was a memorable part of life in Shorewood, Wisconsin. Known as the fastest passenger train in the world, the Chicago and Northwestern Railway's Twin Cities 400 traveled the 400 miles between Chicago and Minneapolis in 400 minutes. Through the magic of today's technology, you can relive the experience of the 400 twice a night with the ghost train. I remember vividly the smell of the diesel, you know, and the, I could hear the idling of the engine the rhythm of the train and seeing all the sights on the way down from a whole different perspective than a freeway. It brings back vivid memories each time I'm on a train today. Well, the village of Shorewood was um, started in 1900 or, or incorporated in 1900. Um, at that, before that time, it was part of the town of Milwaukee and we were recognized in 1900, August of 1900, and incorporated as the village of East Milwaukee. And that name stuck with them until 1917, at which point they decided to change it to Shorewood. 2017 will be the centennial of the name change to Shorewood. Public Art Shorewood is a committee in the village of Shorewood. And our purpose is to identify art and placemaking uh, locations throughout the village of Shorewood that would individually and together work to enhance the experience of living in Shorewood or visiting Shorewood. The Ghost Train is a lighting and sound installation that will be on the Oak Leaf Trail Bridge in Shorewood. The Ghost Train is what we call the bookend to the Jaume Plensa installation, which is in Atwater Park. It is the next of a total of 15 installations, all of which have been strategically located throughout Shorewood at portals to Shorewood. Through technology, it brings back the past. So essentially, it time folds. It time folds the period between 1935 and 1963, when the Chicago and Northwestern 400 and 401 passed through Shorewood over the bridge, it time folds it to now and in the future through a ghost. 
the ghost of a train. 400 was a train run by the Chicago and Northwestern. It started coming through Shorewood in 1935, was actually its first run, and those, the 400 referred to the trains that were running between Chicago and Minneapolis at that time. It cut down the number of places that they were going to stop, and it caused the, the trains to go about 400 miles in 400 minutes, and thus the name 400. The train went through Shorewood from 1935, approximately, until the early 60s. You know, I used to actually ride that train every summer. It was very exciting. Every summer was very, very exciting to travel on the train. When it would start to move, um, after, after it uh, started down the tracks a bit, I would go to the, between the cars, there was a, um, a, a Dutch door. And I would, if the top part wasn't already open and latched, I would open it myself and latch it and stand, you know, with my chin on the door. And that's the way I would travel up there with the wind on my face looking at all the farmland and the woods and everything like that. But I love to just hang out the window and feel that wind on my face. And the conductors never shooed me away. They never, you know, made me go sit down or anything. They would let me stand there as long as my little leg could hold me. And that's how I enjoyed my trips to the Twin Cities. You don't forget those sounds. You don't forget the movement of the train. You don't forget the, you forget the clickety-clack of the tracks and, and um, you know, the whistles and things like that. Um, to this day, I'd, if I'm stopped at a train crossing to wait for a train, I never mind. I turn off my radio and open the windows and listen for that train. The wonderful yellow and green color of the train, I think, has just made it a very memorable experience for many people who both rode it or just watched it go by. I began to think, well, wouldn't it be cool if, which is one of my big little, little starters, if we could actually make the bridge the lighting of the bridge looked like there was a train passing. That if we could have light pass across the bridge, we could emulate the, the movement of the train cars and even the movement of the windows and the headlight. And that's where I came up with the term ghost train because it would be an illusion, kind of a suggestion, not literally, but a hint uh, that there was a, a train passing over the bridge. The idea of combining public art with history is just very appealing. To actually make this, the ghost train effect work, it'll first start off with some sound effects. You'll hear the train bells, and then you'll hear the train whistle as it approaches. You'll also see some red uh, signals on top of the, the towers, the abutments of the, of the bridge to signify the approach of the train. And then as the train approaches, you'll see a glow begin to uh, increase across the bridge, and then suddenly you'll see the headlights sweep across, you'll see chunks of yellow that are moving across the bridge, and those are representing the train cars themselves. Groups of, of a lighter color on the top part of the bridge that will suggest the windows of those train cars. So that'll all be synchronized as it goes across, and it'll be followed by a little red tail light, and so this, this movement across the bridge is what's really conveying the illusion of the ghost train. The technology behind the ghost train starts with the LED fixtures. Uh, each one of these fixtures has a red, blue, and green emitting LED. Across the top of the bridge, we have 60 strings of 50 dots each. So there's 3,000 of these individual dots that we can control separately and it'll refresh those individual LEDs 40 times a second so we can get some very fast effects going on. They don't use much energy at all and they have a really great reliability and lifetime. We're going to be running the ghost train once each direction each evening as it used to basically go. The 400 was from Minneapolis to Chicago and the 401 from Chicago to Minneapolis. So we'll be running the ghost train effect roughly on the same schedule and at the same speed as the original train. We feel that it will very much become a point of interest and an attraction to not only the village, the city, the county and the state, but probably beyond. And people will then associate it with the village of Shorewood. I think it's important to keep the culture of the community alive. And uh, this, is, this is something that every age group can enjoy, every age group.
You can experience the ghost train every night traveling across the Oak Leaf Trail Bridge at Capitol Drive in Shorewood, once northbound, then southbound a half hour later. See the ghost train's summer schedule posted online at tinyurl.com slash Shorewood Ghost Train. Visit the Milwaukee PBS website at milwaukeepbs.org and click on the arts page or check out the arts page on Facebook for more art stories. On the next episode of the Arts Page, we meet three legends come to life on stage. Marquette basketball coach Al McGuire, Milwaukee-born Mr. Showmanship Liberace, and swing and singer Louis Prima. I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for watching, and please join us next time on the Arts Page. Funding for the Arts Page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Committed to bringing the creative arts to underserved audiences, the Helen Daniels Bader Fund encourages collaboration and innovation that strengthens our community to make our world a better place to live.